uh, with Liz Cheney and others speaking out, um, and a wider serious threat um, that can't be underestimated or dismissed as something that only happens over there. Uh, your view tonight. Now, that's right, Ari. That was really excellent. I mean, it's not only that it doesn't happen over there. It doesn't happen necessarily with huge drama, the Reichstag fire in 1933, Caesar crossing the Rubicon and making or allegedly making dramatic statements. It can happen step by step. You know, the Washington Post slogan at the beginning of the Trump years was what, democracy dies in darkness, but democracy also dies in dusk. And there are a lot, if he gets elected, and suddenly there are people in the Defense Department who are changing some of the military promotion systems. There are people in the Justice Department. The rules, the norms, some of these aren't laws, but they're rules or they're norms. The presidents all get involved and criminal prosecutions go away. There's an assistant attorney general who's happy to talk to the White House about who's being prosecuted and who's not. You can go on and on and on, but these things can happen incrementally and you know, it's a mistake to th think that necessarily there will be the military storming the White House and replacing civilian rule. And that's, in a way, what's so dangerous here, because Trump is a very effective demagogue who will use some of the uh, forms of democracy and go along with some of the institutions. There'll be some lawyer there at the Justice Department who will say, like John Eastman did during the coup, this is all fine. It's not going to look like a coup necessarily at first, if, if we have a dramatic view of a coup, but it can be just as dangerous. Hmm. Mark? I mean, I think it's it's true. I mean, one thing we, we talk about, actually, we, there's a lot of talk about this in, in the last few weeks. I think it's starting to pick up, which I think is a good thing. Um, but, but also, if you think about the very end of the Trump administration, sort of, you know, January 6th through January 20th, um, there was a period where, you know, in the 25 years I've been in Washington, and many people I've spoken to have been here longer, like Bill, um, th that was the scariest period time I've ever been in Washington. I mean, the, the insurrection itself was scary enough. But, yeah, you had you had military in the streets. No one knew what the president, who was still in the White House, was capable of. He had absolutely no checks and balances at all. And you had people inside the White House, ostensibly his allies on the Hill in the White House, saying, we just have to land the plane. We don't know what he's capable of. It was sort of a window into what a Trump completely unbound, without any checks and balances, could look like. You know, it was it was a very sort of spent force at that point. But I think if you sort of look that look at that and you kind of project it into the future and what the next four years could look like, it's a very chilling um, thought and something that I think people need to consider. Yeah, I appreciate both of you putting it at that level. And, and Bill, you've worked on this a lot. Uh, so much has changed, right? The world changes, technology changes, um, and yet the fundamentals don't. Um, we hear about Orwellian language. Ministry of Truth, everything is backwards. Right? Donald Trump may not be a scholar of, of literature or history, and yet there he lands on the same kind of demagoguery. And I mentioned Frank Ocean, uh, who's a great singer, also to speaking to something deeper, which is going all the way back to the, the levels of power and oppression. And as you know, marginalized communities are very familiar with the, how scary a mob can be, how out of control, how fast it can happen. Um, it could be um, black and brown people in America, could be uh, Muslim Americans or people who are accused of being Muslim American right after 9-11, could be Jews in the World War II context or in the recent conflict, right? Groups where, oh, the mob, you know exactly how scary the mob is. And so I, I turn to that language for your analysis here of what we're hearing from Trump. I'm going to play a brief bite uh, for the purpose of making sure we understand that when he is referring to uh, voting, uh, it's actually usually him talking about voter intimidation, um, which is still a crime in parts of this in, in the country. Take a listen. The most important part of what's coming up is to guard the vote. And you should go into Detroit and you should go into Philadelphia and you should go into some of these places, Atlanta, and you should go into some of these places. And we got to watch those votes when they come in. Atlanta, Detroit, uh, places where black Americans and Democrats do tend to vote and watch and get there and intimidate. This is a man who was able to spark uh, the, the insurrection in Washington by summoning people. Uh, where does that fit in and how vigilant should, uh, should everyone be in understanding what is being said uh, and what, it, what is being meant? I mean, Trump has always toyed with violence and sort of encouraging it among his supporters, praising it occasionally. But now it's gotten much more serious and more systematic. And that fits very much with how democracies crumble, right? There's sort of an organized party that serves one man. They start to figure out how to manipulate the levers of government. 
Uh, and then they also use uh, violence and mobs and intimidation from outside of government. And sometimes that matches up or meshes up with parts of what's happening inside government. But that's very much the case in Italy, if you look at Mussolini's takeover. And, and so I think it's not a, you know, one shouldn't just dismiss Trump's, uh, the violence of Trump's rhetoric, the dehumanization of his opponents, the attacks on weakest uh, weak communities to start with, because they're the easiest to pick on and to, and to, and, and to play, uh, you know, uh, on the bigotry against. Yeah. And Mark, the politics of this matters because everyone's waiting for someone else to deal with it in the Republican side. Um, you could argue, and I want to be clear about this, there are some Democrats who may stand to benefit electorally and want to scare everyone. Every election is the most important, and they may or may not be directly involved in holding the line. So the, as soon as the partisanship comes in, it can work in a lot of different ways. Having said that, uh, everyone was waiting. McConnell was telling The New York Times, maybe Trump really should be disqualified from office. Wouldn't that be handy for them? But he didn't really want to go as far as doing it. And so politics abhors a vacuum, and very few Republicans, even when Trump is on the ballot, the ones running for his spot, as we've famously seen, don't want to get into it. Here is, for your uh, breakdown, Mark, here's DeSantis. Do you condemn the discipline. use of the word vermin, I don't, then? I, I, I don't use the term, but what I don't do is play the media's game where I'm asked to referee other people. He's responsible for his words. He's responsible for his conduct. I'm responsible for mine. Mark? Yeah, I mean, all, all of this is true, but it is emblematic of someone else will take care of the problem. I mean, there's a now somewhat infamous kind of blind quote that ran on the Washington Post during the transition last time. When, you know, Trump was saying, you know, he's going to dispute the election, he's going to fight, you know, no one was really congratulating the new president-elect Joe Biden because they were sort of waiting to see when Trump would, would sort of, you know, fizzle himself out. And someone said, you know, what's the price in humoring him for a certain amount of time? Um, it was like a senior official or something like that. That's essentially been the Republican platform, you know, pretty much since, you know, January or pretty much since January of 2017. It's humoring Donald Trump, waiting for someone else to come along. And look, the Senate didn't do it after January 6th. Um, and it doesn't look like anyone's done it, you know, to this point on the trail. And, you know, Liz Cheney and many other, I mean, Chris Christie, on this campaign have, have certainly been very strong on this, but ultimately the critical mass of the party is not in any place where they're in a position to stop him right now. 